Hello? Hey, good. It's still morning, right? Good morning. <laughs> good morning for now. Uh, we're glad to have you all here to receive our uh, general conference update. Uh, we are going to have another one, I think. I forget when. Was the... There's an annual. Oh, there's an annual conference briefing. But my guess is they're going to cover a lot of general conference stuff, too. Um, so you're welcome to that. Um, but we're going to start off with the word of prayer, and uh, we'll uh, turn it over to Daniel and, and Sarah after that. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious God, on this Pentecost Sunday, we are reminded of the way in which your spirit can do amazing things. And uh, despite concerns and um, fears, Lord, we are so grateful that we have experienced some measure of hope and joy. And we ask God that as we uh, hear what's going on in the life of our denomination in the United Methodist Church, that you would be present with us as we receive the news uh, and as we are also prepared then to be bearers of good news as we go forth. And so we lift up this time in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks. Um, so my name is Daniel Colbert, um, and this is Sarah Hasmer, and we were both... Um, we were both at General Conference in Charlotte. Um, I was uh, serving as a delegate from the Baltimore Washington Conference. Sarah was observing. Um, so what happened at General Conference? The same sentence kept coming up when me and my fellow delegates reflected on what had just happened, and that's, we got our church back. This, the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church that had been divided and fighting for decades now, but especially in the last 10 to five years, has been, we're able to move past that now. We're able to, we look more like the church that we remember being. Um, so let's talk about what that actually means in terms of legislation, and then uh, we can talk generally about what it was like in Charlotte, take any questions that you have. So the, the big three goals that the centrist progressive coalition went to Charlotte with, we called them the three R's. They were remove harmful language in the Book of Discipline, pass the revised social principles, and regionalization. So the first one of those, I think, is the one that's made a lot of headlines that you've probably read. Um, we've removed prohibitions on LGBT cl clergy. We removed prohibitions on same-sex weddings. It's now up to individual congregations and individual clergy members what uh, sorts of ceremonies they will celebrate. Um, is that am I covering all the? That's all the harmful language. The bigger, the big ones. Oh, and the funding ban. That there's no longer a ban on uh, Methodist agencies funding uh, queer caucus groups. Uh, we passed the revised social principles. The social principles, if you're unfamiliar, are uh, the public statement of where the United Methodist sta Church stands on a number of political and social issues. I mean, it's everything from you know war and peace to economic issues and environmental issues. Um, again, the big headline you probably saw is that we no longer believe that marriage is between a man and a woman only. We have... Uh, we believe that it can be between a man and a woman or between two people. Um, and we can talk about the details of how that if, uh, changed on the floor. It was actually pretty interesting that um, an African delegate proposed def our new definition um, on the floor. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. It feels like very loud to me, but I'm, I know I'm, it's not for y'all, great. And then the third R um, was regionalization, which is probably the most complicated one, but it's ch we've voted to change the way the United Methodist Church is structured globally. It used to be, well, it is currently, uh, a structure that comes out of our colonialist past, really, that we were a church founded in the US, we were a US-centric church that sent missionaries abroad, 
and we thought of us as you know the, there's the church in the U.S. and then there's everybody else, and so we had the U.S. is organized into jurisdictions, and the rest of the world is organized into central conferences. We voted to change that, well, change part of that, so that the U.S. is now one region, and the rest of the world will also be divided into regions. We'll still have the jurisdictional structure within the U.S. That might be something we revisit in the future, but because it has a, its own racist history. Um, but we're going to move to what well, we've voted to move to uh, a structure where the U.S. is a region and all the rest of the world are also regions and everybody's on an equal footing. That also gives each region the ability to adapt the Book of Discipline in certain ways to fit their cultural and political context uh, to, to serve their ministry in that region of the world. That is going to require, it required constitutional changes, and because of that, it needs to be ratified by votes at annual conferences, which will take place over the next year and a half or so. I think that's the three R's. Do you have anything else on that? Um, just with a note that, as you said, a year and a half. So Baltimore, Washington annual conference is at the end of this month in like a, a week and a half. Um, it's, it's so we will not be. What? It's this week. It's this week, right? No. It's oh, the, the week, week after. after. Okay, after Memorial Day, yes. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, but it is too early to vote. So Baltimore, Washington conference, at least we will be voting next year for, um, regionalization ratification, which we learned, um, could use some more education by folks across the annual conference. Um, I just wanted to highlight that not everything we did at general conference had to do with LGBTQ inclusion. There was the business of the church to be done in a lot of different ways. And I wanted to highlight a few things that I thought were a big deal and worth worth noting. Uh, one is that we approved uh, full communion with the Episcopal Church. Um, this is a big deal. Uh, is there some, this means, I had to ask people what this meant. Um, <laughs> it means basically that we recognize each other's sacraments and each other's ordination um, so that Methodist clergy could serve in the Episcopal churches and vice versa. Um, I think there's a, a pretty interesting, like, I don't know, irony to the fact that as the, the United Methodist Church is going through a process of division and splitting off, we are, in a sense, reuniting with the church that we broke off of, you know, 200 years ago. Um, we also approved sacramental authority for deacons. So... Congratulations, Reverend Catherine, or I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, this means that, that deacons will be able to perform baptisms and preside over uh, on communion. As not yet. Oh, we won't bother you and yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, in January. Um, so most general conference legislation takes effect in the January following the year. We made sure to amend some of the petitions, particularly about LGBTQ um, charges, same-sex marriages, to have an effective date of right after the general conference. But so that is, though we still have, or excuse me, ordained deacons, not me, um, still have some sacramental authority now. It will be easier um, starting in, in January. Uh, another thing we did is that we reduced the base apportionment rate for local churches. Um, that I think is very exciting. Um, it means local churches are going to get to keep more of their own money. Um, I was like sitting next to a head of a general agency while we voted on this, and I had to like vote yes and flip my device over. So, <laughs> but uh, I think it's great. I, I want to you know facilitate the work that we do in the local church as much as I can. Um, so that was great for me. Um, uh, we passed a few like resolutions apologizing, um, apologizing to victims of abuse in the church. Um, that was well overdue and, and needed. We also apologized to the Kingdom of Hawaii. I just found this very interesting. I didn't know the history that the Methodist Church was involved in the illegal overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Um, and we're gonna apologize for that, which 
Okay. I am not a trained singer or anything, so. <laughs> Great. Um, a few things that we didn't do. There were a lot of petitions related to extending the ability of churches to disaffiliate, to leave the United Methodist Church if they disagree with mostly with what the things that we did um, in Charlotte. I was shocked to find out the extent of disaffiliation, especially in the southeastern jurisdiction, that you know, in Baltimore, Washington, we had 30-something churches leave out of 600-something. Some conferences in the South lost half their churches. So we're putting it into that. Um, there was temporary authority for churches to leave with their property uh, if they you know, paid some apportionments ahead of time. That was temporary, and it sunsetted, and we did not renew it. It's gone. Um, there, is, there are still procedures to go th that you can go through if you want to close a church, sell the property, um, but it's on an individual basis. It should be rare and not routine. Um, you know, we're not trying to like force any individual people to keep coming to a church. You can go to another church if you want to, but we want to remain in ministry with everyone that we have been in ministry with. Um, so that was a really contentious point. A lot of people had very strong feelings about disaffiliation and wanting to actually make it easier than it has been, um, and we did not approve any of that. And that was that was overwhelming. One of the things that we went to as American delegates, not really knowing how some of the Central Conference delegates felt about that, um, it was overwhelming. The, the delegates from the Central Conferences don't want disaffiliation. They want to stay United Methodist, um, and they want churches in the US to stay United Methodist and support our ministries together. Um, also, uh, uh, build on that with uh, we also, or delegates, um, technically I wasn't a delegate, um, uh, voted to support Eurasia annual conferences disaffiliating, which is part of the argument that we don't need more disaffiliation procedures. Are, there are already ways in our book of discipline for annual conferences to disaffiliate. They wanted to form their own autonomous Methodist church. Um, and in my research for, I was in two Wesley classes um, dealing with general conference. And um, previously, I think it was a, a United Methodist group in uh, Sweden that left to form the Uniting Church in Sweden, which we also share full communion with. And so um, it was nice to see the autonomy respected of what folks in Eurasia wanted and proof that we don't need these additional disaffiliation procedures that started in St. Louis, and it's pretty much about LGBTQ inclusion or exclusion. Um, we, can, we can move beyond, and it was nice that those provisions in St. Louis expired, but the symbolism of actually deleting them from the Book of Discipline, so no more Book of Discipline will be printed, with what was um, passed in St. Louis is, is uh, I think, a good sign about the church moving forward, which I will admit I was a bit skeptic going into Charlotte, and I was very pleased with the result. Yeah, yeah, no part of the traditional plan will ever appear in print, which is a joy. Um, okay, another thing that we didn't do is there were a number of petitions that would have move the church towards not just a neutral stance on LGBTQ inclusion, but a affirming stance that, you know, we consider candidates for ordination regardless of orientation, that we don't discriminate in hiring, things like that. We did not support those. And this was, this was a strategic decision that as we are still seeking regionalization, those are things that Perhaps a U.S. regional conference will be able to do in the future, but we thought that it would possibly be too divisive in some of the central conferences who then might not support regionalization. This was, you know, 
a controversial strategic choice. And when we got there, when we got to Charlotte and saw that we overwhelmingly had the votes as progressive centrists to do pretty much whatever we wanted, um, this became kind of, some people wanted to change our strategy. We ended up actually not even really getting to those petitions on the floor. Um, they, they hadn't passed in committee, and so they didn't get to the floor of the plenary session. The conference works like Congress, where there's legislative committees, and then it all goes to the floor. It's not a great way to run the church, but it's what we have. Um, so anyway, so if you, you might hear some disappointment about that. Um, I think I think it was the right strategic decision, and it will allow us. I mean, we're still going to be affirming here at Silver Spring, um, and hopefully, lots more churches are going to join us in that. And to quickly expound on that, one thing that I noted from um, opening worship, uh, the. Uh, leaving bishop, uh, president of the Council of Bishops, Bishop Bickerton, gave the sermon and um, really set the tone, I think, for the rest of the conference with things like, if you want to be here, help us move forward. If you don't want to go forward with the United Methodist Church, like, there's the door. Um, but also shared um, a prayer that he says um, repeatedly, before each time he preaches, remove me from me and fill me with you. Remove me from me and fill me with you. And then he adapted that for the context of general conference and said, remove us from us and fill us with you. Remove us from us and fill us with you. And I found that very powerful because we have to remember how different different contexts are. So I was a legislative steward for the Judicial Administration Committee, and we had petitions submitted that incre supported increasing diversity based on disability and sexual orientation, and our committee deleted the sexual orientation because we were trying to get to neutral. And it was hard when other queer folks were asking me, why did we do this? But I learned, like, there are some places in Africa where even just talking about LGBTQ inclusion risks harm. And so having that mindset of it's not all about me, not all about the United States, let's learn more and build relationships with folks in other contexts so that at least we can have more autonomy with regionalization to figure out what works in, in our context. And we are not leaving behind Africa, for example. We very much uh, want to maintain a relationship with LGBTQ plus folks in Africa. Just understand that like the United States can't dominate what happens in Africa. That has to come. From, from folks in Africa. So um, that was a complex place for me as a queer candidate to be in, but I think it was the um, right call because we also want to say, in general, less in the worldwide book of discipline because for 52 years we've explicitly discriminated against a segment of people. Um, and so saying less at the worldwide level will help us have, I think, that unity in the United Methodist Church while allowing regions to figure out what works in their context. And ultimately, I think maintaining those relationships between churches in the US that are affirming and churches in other places that are not I mean, can help bring them along with, as they meet folks and, and understand who we are. Are we, do you think we've covered all of the sort of legislative nuts and bolts and we can kind of talk about what it felt like? I guess I'll just also add on the budget <laughs> because y'all had to cut the budget a lot. Um, 40%. Yes, like 40%. Um, it was very interesting to hear the discussion of, um, in 2016 it was proposed for I think five new bishops to be added to Africa. 
And um, given the budget concerns, there was only two moving forward. And so it was interesting to hear about those dynamics. And also, we had concerns about US bishops. And it just went through my mind with regionalization, like, let the African delegates decide what to do for their bishops and let US folks decide. We don't need to spend this much time sort of uh, debating over each other. But we lost seven bishops, I think, with the cuts. Yeah, yeah. So um, budget realities are real, especially after the next two years when the apportionments from the churches that disaffiliated goes away. Yeah, it was the sort of double whammy of, of the pandemic and disaffiliation that led to that decision. Okay, um, so I will, just to talk about what it felt like being in Charlotte and being at the convention, uh, the, the, the conference, I will confess that I went feeling a little bit cynical about it. I, I don't really think that parliamentary procedure and legislative committees and Robert's rules is like how the work of God's kingdom happens. Um, and I still think that. Um, but I will say that I was surprised at how much I did feel like it was a holy time and how much I did feel the spirit moving on the margins as I made connections with like-minded people from around the world and also with people I didn't agree with on very much, but we could work together on other things we did agree on. I, you know, I met people from Africa, from uh, Europe, from all over. I felt joy celebrating with people who have been working for a very long time, a lot longer than me, um, to finally, like they've been, it was like, I think it was like pushing on a door that had been locked and was just suddenly flew open. Like it was, it was easy, right? In the end, we, all these things I'm talking about passed overwhelmingly. And sorry, do you, do you want to share anything? Cause I have a, if I have time, I have a quick story I want to share about. Okay. So there's a story I heard about something that happened at, at General Conference that, uh, yeah, I just think you all would like to hear. So the, I met a guy there. Um, I'm not going to use his real name. You're going to see why, but I'm going to call him Bubba because I think that's going to give you a good image of this guy. He's a big southern man, deep voice, southern accent. The first time I met him, he told me how excited he was that our conference center was next door to the NASCAR Hall of Fame. <laughs> and he showed me his race car. He has a race car. Bubba was elected in 2019 as part of the WCA slate from his conference. The WCA is the, the conservative anti-gay caucus. So he was elected in 2019 as par part of that. Everybody, and, and the whole delegation was WCA folks from his conference. Everybody else on that delegation left the UMC. Their church is disaffiliated and they went with them. So everybody else got replaced with centrists and progressives, including a friend of mine. And so this friend of mine is like, look, we tried to get rid of Bubba. There's nothing we can do. He's, he's duly elected. He's still a Methodist in good standing. He's on the delegation. So they, they met with him and they said, look, we're just trying to get, like you said, we're trying to get back to neutral. We're not going to force anyone to accept anything they're not really we're ready to accept yet. We want to go back to 1972. And he's like, you know, I think I'd be okay with that. So they started working with him. They invited him to their strategic meetings. They talked about legislation. And a couple weeks before conference, my friend, who's on the delegation with him, took him out for a beer. And he confessed. He said, you know, for 30 years, I've known that I'm gay. And I just always thought that it was wrong. And now I'm starting to think that it's okay. And so we went to general conference. On the last day of general conference, all of the queer delegates got together for a group photo. And Bubba joined them. This man felt so affirmed by what happened at a United Methodist general conference that he basically came out. And if that's not 
miraculous. Like, I just don't know what it is. I, I did not know that story. That is, that is super powerful. Thank you for sharing, Daniel. So, um, I, sorry, I just, oh, yeah. That is a reminder to me that legislation is all well and good, but this work needs to be liberating, not just on an institutional level, but on a personal level. Um, and that's the work that is still before us in so many places in the United Methodist Church. Did you go to St. Louis? No. Okay. This was my first, so yeah. Also, this was my first general conference, and everybody kept telling me I picked the right one. <laughs> so um, I went not as a delegate, but as an observer, though I was more active this time. I was in St. Louis at the 2019 special called General Conference, and this one, and the atmosphere was a world's difference apart. I will say, going in with my skepticism um, into this general conference, I had been in St. Louis where the majority of Commission on a Way Forward and Council of Bishops folks were going for the one church plan, and there was this minority report about a traditionalist plan that delegates prioritized and increased the penalties for LGBTQ inclusion. And so I needed some more seeing to believe that there would not be more harmful minority reports that come forward and got prioritized. And so in my judicial administration committee, we had chargeable offenses. And so it was hard to accept that we had enough votes, not just in legislative committee, but on the floor to get rid of the discriminatory chargeable offenses. And I'll also add there was an element of, it was hard to believe, like some, I don't know if shock is, is the right word, but May 1st is my birthday. Two years ago, um, on my birthday, the Global Methodist Church formed. On my birthday this year, my certified deacon candidacy in the Baltimore Washington Conference went from in December when I was certified, it was an act of sacred resistance against the Book of Discipline. May 4th, it just turned into simply being sacred. And that is, it, it, it is, it is overwhelming with joy, while I also know there are some folks in Africa facing threats because of some of the um, LGBTQ plus affirming stuff we did at, at General Conference. Um, and I also recognize that, unfortunately, I didn't think, lots of others didn't think ahead about just resolutions and making sure that they were included in chargeable offenses as there are still two clergy people from Mississippi who are on unpaid administrative leave because they officiated a same-sex wedding. And while we took care of chargeable offenses going forward, because they had a just resolution, their unpaid administrative leave is not canceled. And so it's just a reminder, oh yes, and it was ironic as um, Bishop Sharma Lewis presided over the consent calendar item that removed the chargeable, of, or excuse me, removed the prohibition on um, our ordination. And so that was um, ironic, poetic justice, not sure, but um, for those who aren't familiar, she used to be the bishop in Virginia Conference where I lived, grew up, my dad and his brother were, um, are uh, elders ordained in the Virginia Conference, but I did not feel safe there to explore my calling. And so that's why I moved to Maryland. And so it's just a, re a reminder that we can change some things through legislation, but a lot of it is changing 
hearts and minds to get that cultural change because we can delete, as we know, we can delete discriminatory laws, but that doesn't mean discrimination still isn't going to happen. And so that is, I think, part of one of the things going forward that we have to be mindful of and work to root out intersectional discrimination because we have these issues of churches who don't want a black pastor or don't want a woman pastor and now we're facing the don't want a queer pastor and so um, how can we eliminate more of the discrimination that is still existing in our churches today so we're not done so yes we can celebrate but we are not done all right, but I think we are done and uh, <laughs> can take, um, if, if anyone has any questions, yes. Uh, it wasn't specifically debated. The, the revised social principles passed as a whole with no amendments, except for the change to the definition of marriage. Um, so yeah, the, the revised social principles, yes, they passed. I, there wasn't any specific debate. I, don't, I wasn't observing that committee, so I don't know if the committee talked about it at all. Um, but on the floor, we didn't have any debate about them. Just. There are some changes to it. I couldn't speak to exactly what the changes are. Yeah, I would have to look, but what was in the revised social principles is what passed regarding abortion, reproductive freedom. Um, oh, so it was written um, for the 2020 general conference. Um, so it was written, it was a process, years long process of rewriting them. Um, that I guess it was the 2016 conference asked for them to be redrafted. It might have been 2012. Maybe 2012. It, it took a while to draft them. But anyway, they were, they were ready and were supposed to be voted on in 2020. Um, and we didn't get around to them. Obviously, we didn't meet in 2020. So, um, yeah, it's, it's the more recent update. I can... So, um, Let me. no, um, we were in these WhatsApp channels and delegates and, and advocates were preparing in case there was that scenario. Um, the rules of the general conference limit how many people can debate a certain petition. And I am 99% sure that um, the abortion reproductive freedom aspect of the revised social principles was in the same petition or, or definitely same calendar um, as the revised definition of marriage. And so essentially delegates chose to debate what the definition of marriage should be rather than spending the limited number of, of speeches they have debating um, reproductive justice. So that's sort of a back and forth, which also there was an amendment with, uh, or excuse me, a petition about um, divesting from fossil fuels that did not get time because there were just so many petitions that the delegates just could not get to them all. Um, and there's yes, I think we are planning on doing a study possibly this summer of the new revised social principles um, here so we can dig into them at all. The, there is, I pulled up the section, the new section on abortion. It's like several paragraphs long, um, so I don't want to read it all. It's, I will ad admit that I don't love it, really. Um, it uses, you know, we oppose late-term or partial birth abortion, a process known as dilation as an extraction. We call for the end to this practice. I, I, I really rankle at that, but um, I, It's, it is definitely not fully condemning abortion in all circumstances. It is also, I don't know that it, I, I don't really read it as affirming a right 
to choose. Um, it's it's more kind of wishy washy than that, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, again, it was kind of a partly a strategic decision to not because God, if we were to debate all of these statements in the social principles in a body of 800 people, um, it would have taken the whole two weeks or, or more, and we wouldn't have gotten anything else done. So I think the, the idea was that these were carefully drafted by a team um, working with church and society, uh, and we mostly just decided that we were going to just, just pass them as is um, without changes. And this was like around a decade's worth process of drafting these social principles with input from, again, people from around the connection, so not just in the United States. And so keeping that in mind and also replacing the entire social principles with a revised set, like Daniel said, that is a lot of legislation. And so um, keeping in mind that the social principles are a living document, so in future general conferences, we can continue to amend them as we live into these revised social principles, identify any needs change, things like that. So um, I, I think that was very important for me as the lawyer who like wants to do all of these edits to things to keep in mind, oh yes, when we're talking about, I don't know, what was it, a hundred more petitions, something like that with the revised social principles, you just don't have time <laughs> to be nitpicky with all of those. Um, yeah, I was briefly, <laughs> I was incorrectly assigned to um, one of the church and society committees and was meeting with them. And they had also had, they didn't have the abortion language. They, they, they had the different parts of the social principles. Um, and there was some, in the committee, we also didn't love some of the language on, on war and, and peace, which refers to like, uh, proportional responses and limited uh, military action. And we just thought the church should be against war um, on the whole. And, you know, recognizing that governments might need to take a more pragmatic approach, but the church should be for peace. Um, but we also made a strategic decision in that committee not to offer any amendments to the social principles. Um, so more fun to be had at future general conferences when we do decide to address these. <laughs> Honestly, that is, that is another thing that I wanted to say is that one of the great things about hopefully putting our division about human sexuality behind us is that it was sucking all the air out of the room at every general conference for the last two decades. I mean, now we can talk about other things. I mean, I was working with... I had some friends who were really interested in some of the petitions related to climate change, and they're like, next time, do, let's do climate change. And I was like, yeah, next time we can do climate change. Like, we can talk about that um, for a lot more time than we had at this, this conference. Yeah, Elaine? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just Googled right now revised social principles, UMC, and they came up. Let's see if I can. Church and society has a lot of resources mm -hmm. um, on them, and we are hoping we will check. Uh, they will be continuing to put more out so that we can live into these and get them um, more part of our everyday life. As Church and Society, which, which led the formation of the Revised Social Principles, had several um, uh, webinars to educate folks on them. And, and one of the questions from a webinar participant was, so how are we sharing this information with local churches? <laughs> um, and so one of the things that we have to keep in mind, which is great that we're doing the study, is that Church and Society can put out all of these resources, but unless we actually connect and translate them to our local context. Revised social principles don't mean a lot. And so that is some of the next part that we have to lean into um, and learn together. And I'm very thankful for Silver Springs uh, Justice Ministries, as I think that is one of the ways that we can um, 
work on, okay, <laughs> these revised social principles in the abstract, what do they mean in Montgomery County, for example? Any other questions? If anyone is wonky and into judicial counsel stuff, um, you can see me as I got to experience there were issues <laughs> with judicial counsel elections that I, I went through and crafted a resolution that didn't actually get but put forth, but I'm not gonna bore all of you um, with that, but it was pretty, Exciting if you are a lawyer and nerdy political science person like me. But we have an entirely new, um, well, all nine spots on the Judicial Council were elected. And there is continuity of experience with some people with previous Judicial Council experience being on there. So, um, exciting new day for the church. Thank you all. Thank you.